and happy Friday. Today is our last day of this packet, of this week's packet anyway. You have, of course, your math assignment. You have extra math, just like always. You also have pages 201, 202. We're talking about chapter four, lesson two. And we're multiplying by five and 10. Again, those are things that you all know. You just need a little refresher. You need to kind of refresh your memory on how to do those. You have a reader's work notebook page today, page 168. Possessive nouns. Possessive nouns show that a person, an animal, or a thing owns or has something. This is review for us, but I want to go over it again. To show that one person, animal, or thing has possession, you add an apostrophe and an S. Like cat, you would add cat apostrophe S to show that the cat owns something. Or boy, it would be boy apostrophe S to show that he owns something. Now, if you want to show that more than one, remember that word is plural, more than one person, animal, or thing has possession, you add an S and then you add an apostrophe. So if I want to talk about the boys kickball game, I would say B-O-Y-S with an apostrophe after that. So that is all right there in those bullet points on page 168. There is also a little box right there that tells you the noun and then singular, remember that means one, and plural possessive nouns and it shows you some examples of those. So I want you to look through these and think about if the word is singular or plural and then put that apostrophe in the right spot. If it's singular, remember it's apostrophe S and if it's plural possessive, it's an S apostrophe. So those are a little tricky sometimes. Go ahead and do page 168 again, just like any time. If you have any questions, text me or email me. I am available from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. So if you have any questions, please feel free to let me know and I will be happy to talk you through something and help you out with it. You should be reading 20 minutes a day. And you also should today write a journal entry. I want you to take your journal I sent home on Monday and I want you to write a story. I'd like for you to send me the story if you don't mind. I would like to see what you, what you have to write about. I would like for you to write any kind of a story that you want to today. I am not going to give you a topic or a writing prompt today. Just anything that you want to write about it can be a made up story or it could be a true story. I also want you to do your, consume, your Producers and Consumers book. Today we're on pages 10 through 13. Pages 10 and 11 don't have much on there. It's about Sacramento, California, America's farm to fork capital. You'll have to read what a farm to fork capital means. And I want you to look at the next two pages. And that's all about being a consumer. That's what some of you really like to do. If you like to go shopping, then you like to be a consumer. But there are other ways that we can be consumers. So this will give you a little bit of information about that. And hopefully someday the stores will open again and we can all start being consumers again like we would like to be. So that is part of your work for today. And not as much to do today as the other days, I don't think. But I do want to hear your, or read your journal articles. If you haven't been turning in your work, make sure you get everything turned in to me today. Thank you to those who've been doing their Lexia and their Mobimax math. Some of you need to get that done every week, and some of you have done an excellent job of getting that done each and every week. Some of you still need to be working on those things. You can also do your Mobimax science if you would like to do that. And you can also do your splash math and your prodigy. And always, always, always you can AR test. My class does not have very many points since we just got out of school and I would like to see us getting a little more points. Some of you are doing an excellent job, but I want to see the rest of you testing a little bit too. I'm gonna read a few more pages of Virginia that will be done for the week next Monday. You do not have to pick up a packet. You have everything that you need. If you choose to turn in your work on Monday at Parkside, they will be there from eight to five, and you can turn everything in on Monday. 
If you have turned everything in electronically, like some of you have been doing, you do not have to go back to Parkside and return anything. Everything I have already seen if you've done it electronically. If you choose to turn it in Monday 8 to 5 at Parkside, stay in your car and someone, Mr. Wood or Mrs. Hayes or someone, will be there to pick it up for you and they will give you your new packet. If you want to do it electronically though, there is no need for you to go back to Parkside and turn anything in if I've already seen all of your work. I really appreciate your texts and your, and your emails so that I know what you're up to and I know what you're getting done. Some of you have really stayed on top of it and gotten a lot of things done. Next week we'll have a few more things that we need to do and hopefully we will be finding out very soon when we will be returning to school. But let's go ahead and read a, lot, a little bit about Virginia. December 16th, 1864. Yesterday I began reading Swiss Family Robinson to Mrs. Porter. I must say it is an exciting story. At home, Paul is still unable to move about. Jane Allen is growing bigger and still feels sick. Jed is restless about his work, aching to go to Georgia to gather news stories about General Sherman. Tonight I tried to cheer them all by telling them about Swiss Family Robinson. I told them we were not unlike the Robinson family, washed up on a strange shore. We must try to make the best of everything. After all, we at least have a roof over our heads and beans every night for dinner. December 17, 1864. Tonight I told everyone more about Swiss Family Robinson. That brave family has just moved into a treehouse. They are planting gardens and hunting and fishing. That should give us strength, I said. If they can survive on a desert island, we can surely survive in Washington City. Jane Ellen laughed and said I should have been a preacher. She said I am very inspiring. December 18, 1864. Soon I will tell my family new stories. Stories about Mrs. Porter's grandchildren. They are coming to visit from New York City for the Christmas holidays. I can hardly wait. I confess I have missed being with other children. These days I feel more like a grown-up than a ten-year-old girl. December 19, 1864. Hurrah! Tomorrow Robert, Sarah, and Eliza Porter will arrive. Sarah and Eliza are eleven-year-old twins and Robert is my age. Their father is an important lawyer in New York City. I cannot wait to hear about their life and tell them all about mine. I can tell them all about the Battle of Gettysburg and about Jed, Paul, and Jane Ellen. I might even tell them that my mother was a Southern Belle. I'll tell them she lived in Virginia and she had two younger brothers whom I've never met. Those brothers might be fighting for the Confederacy now. My uncles could be Rebs. Imagine. I'll tell them. Maybe they'll invite me to visit them in New York City. I feel that tomorrow is the beginning of a great new adventure. December 20th, 1864. I did not actually get to visit with the Porter children today. I was dusting when they arrived. They did not speak to me. They were so excited to see their grandmother. They ran through the house shouting and laughing and chasing the cats. Their pretty mother wore a fur coat. Their father and Robert wore handsome cloaks. Sarah and Eliza wore ribbons in their long, shiny hair. Mrs. Porter introduced them to me, but they did not seem to take notice. Surely that was because they were so excited to see their grandmother. December 21st, 1864. It snowed last night. I only briefly laid eyes on the Porter children today. They left early with their parents. They rode off in a sleigh with bells. When they returned, I heard Robert telling Mrs. Porter all about the Monticello dining room. They had ice cream and sugar cookies there. The girls told her about shopping at De, De, De La Rue's. They bought lilac ribbons for their hair and Paris kid gloves. Again, they did not seem to take notice of me. When Robert ran down the hall chasing the cats, I laughed, but I couldn't seem to catch his eye. When he bumped into me, he did not even say pardon. I felt like a girl made of air. December 22, 1864. Today I felt again as if I were made of air. The Porter children moved about me, never catching my eye. Is this how all servants feel? What about slaves? I cannot imagine how slaves must feel. Why, what if the Porter children owned me? They might even beat me if I didn't do what they wanted. My heart was heavy when I came home. I did not talk to my family at all. 
Our rooms seem shabbier than ever. Poison has entered my heart. I wish to be one of the, por the porter children and not myself. And why not? Ice cream and sugar cookies are far better than beans. And I would love lilac ribbons for my hair. December 23rd, 1864. Today the porter children sat in the dining room while I polished the silver in the parlor. They ate preserved peaches and pears. They talked about their great adventure last night. They went to Ford's new theater and saw Rip Van Winkle. They talked about how funny and amazing it was. None of them spoke a word to me. When I came home, I was quite cross. At dinner, I sighed and said, I wish I could see a play at Ford's new theater someday. Paul said it cost too much to go to the theater. I blurted out that I was sick to death of being poor. Paul looked away. He seemed hurt and surprised. Jane Ellen seemed surprised too. I excused myself from the table saying I was too tired to eat a plate of old beans again. Why can't we ever have peaches or pears, I said. I felt ashamed lying on the sofa. I tried to talk my way out of it. I told myself I'm tired of being the cheerful one all the time. December 24th, 1864. While I dusted, I listened to the Porter children chat again. This time they were talking about visiting the president's house. They spoke about Tad Lincoln as if he were their friend. Tad is only 10 and goes everywhere with his father. I have never seen Tad, but I wish now with all my heart I knew him. I wish with all my soul I was him. Never before have I wished to be someone other than myself. The Porter children have put me under a strange spell. December 25th, 1864, a snowy Christmas day. Jane Ellen stayed in bed. Paul forced himself up. He asked if I would like to go with him to the Finley Hospital tonight. He wants to play his violin for the wounded soldiers. Later, at twilight, Paul and I tread through the wet snow and mud to the hospital. I could tell that his back ached with every step. On the way, sleigh bells jingled on Pennsylvania Avenue. I heard children laughing. I thought I saw the porters ride by, or some other family just like them, a rich, happy family. As we entered the hospital, I heard the cries and groans of wounded soldiers. I dreaded seeing them all. I kept my eyes down as we entered a ward. Paul stood in a corner and began to play his violin. As silent night wafted through the cold, drafty room, the cries ceased. I saw tears stream down the face of a lady nurse. As Paul kept playing, angels seemed to calm the air. The room became warm with a deep, holy feeling. On our walk home, I felt the angels were still with us. I heard no sleigh bells, or at least I didn't notice. For a short while, I felt peaceful and happy just to be myself. And that's all that we're going to read today. I will see you again next week.